Coach Reed. So I passed out note cards uh, at the end of the rows for everybody that if you still have at the end of your row, just take one and pass the rest of the note cards down. Does everybody have a sticky note? At least one sticky note. Okay, good. So we'll need that in a minute. You'll need a pen. I'm sure you can borrow it from neighbor. But as John said, a lot of what I did started out in youth sports. I started working with young players at the age of 16. So I've been coaching for a very long time. And a lot of what I, I do and how I teach comes from what I learned with the little ones. I was also a kindergarten teacher for one year. A kindergarten teacher. But that's it. <laughs> so... But what's crazy is at one point in time I was actually coaching the Cincinnati Saints uh, soccer team, which is a pro team. So I was coaching men. And what was really crazy was one of the kids on the team, it took us about two or three weeks before we finally put off says on the I didn't recognize it. He knew who I was. He was just so afraid. He goes, hey, Coach Reed, I was at your wedding when I was 12. <laughs> so here I am coaching somebody when he was 12, and now he's in his late 20s. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm old. And then we brought the wedding out to the practice one day. I said, look, there's your name right there. So what I found when working with those pro athletes is everything I did with the five-year-olds, it still crosses over. And you watch people like Pep Guardiola, who's coaching at the highest levels of the game, and he's talking about concepts that we're telling people to use with four and five-year-olds. And he's using them with million-dollar athletes. And then you listen to, here at home, you listen to coaches in the NFL who talk about it, right? Some of the coaches in the NFL talk about how they interact with athletes. So a lot of times you'll hear me say something and you'll say, oh, that sounds like five-year-old stuff. It is, because that's where I'm coming from. That's where my brain is. But it is applicable. And my goal, I went back and got a master's in sports psychology, just like Nadine. And then I went back and I got a master's in early childhood development. So my goal was to link theory to practice. Everything I talk about has some kind of theoretical component to it. There's data behind it. It's proven research. And it's always been my thing with Leon. Anytime that I'm worried about whether something's worth putting out to a group of people, I remind myself by going back and looking and saying, hey, this is proven research. This isn't just something I'm making up. And two, I hate when I, some, I'm lectured at or I lecture somebody and they have nothing to take away. So I want to I want to bridge that gap. So today my hope is, and so like I said, some of them may come out in five-year-old language for you higher level coaches. Who was with me yesterday? There was some five-year-old language happening, wasn't it? But some of you higher level coaches probably said, I can twist that to work with the 18, 19, 20-year-olds, right? So everything I'll say today, I hope that I give you some tangible things that you can take away and use tomorrow to help change the way you coach. It's not that we're not coaching right, I'm just adding a little bit more to the recipe to make it even better. All right, so I'm going to talk about leadership secrets of the world's greatest coaching. I'm going to distill it into three main pieces. It's all about... Oh, the mic's not on? You missed all I had to start over? No. <laughs> Sports and activities are an opportunity for to us to build strong character traits, 
develop positive life skills that allow us to seize life and put in front of them role models who help show them, I'm going to use the word, the pathway to success in life, right? Okay? That's what sports does. When they leave at 13, we've blown it. Because the brain continues to form up into the mid-20s. So we're missing at least a decade of work with these athletes to continue to develop their brains so that they're successful human beings. And then we look around and they go, what's wrong with society? I don't know, maybe it was how they left this activity that had an opportunity to help them find a successful group in life. And it's, yes? What's the main driver for kids leaving sports at such a young age? Lack of fun. And I'm actually going to get into what that means in a second, but one of the biggest drivers is, is coaching. When you don't understand the impact you have on your athletes from a quality coaching perspective, you end up creating an environment that doesn't seem like fun to them, and they're going to leave. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, they're going to get bored, and they're going to leave, and they're going to find something that's more fun. Thank you for asking that question. I'm going to go off topic just a little bit. Do we know what the biggest competitor to use sports is? Video games. Video games. <laughs> My son's a Fortnite kid. I know this, <laughs> right? He no longer plays soccer. He plays Fortnite, and he says, "I'm going to be an athlete." And then I find out there's scholarships for him, like both. <laughs> We're going down that route the next three or four years of arguing over Fortnite. He finally got bored of Fortnite, thankfully. But uh, my other son is uh, not a fan of Fortnite. He is 12 years old, and he's he's a geek like me. He's doing the research. Dad, Fortnite's a drug. What he found out is there's research articles out there that actually show that the dopamine levels in the brain when kids are playing Fortnite are very similar to dopamine levels when you're on drugs. They've actually designed the game in a way that it's activating the brain the same way. And they gotta have it, they gotta jump back in when they when they lose the game or get killed, they jump back in and they wanna play again. And they gotta get that reward. We gotta find the treasure chest with more rewards. I mean they're they're frantic about it. And my son's friend's over one day and they're playing, and I can hear the friend and the kid is like standing up and dancing and playing and yelling. I was like, oh my gosh, his brain is going crazy. <laughs> so video games are our biggest competitor. What the video game manufacturers figured out very early on was they, they figured out that if they wanted to create an experience that kept the kids in it and made the kids want to come back, they'd make it about them. They'd ask them what they want. And then they'd build it the way they want. Now the problem is, me being a soccer coach for so many years, that's not how I coach. I'm going to build this training environment, and you're going to come into my world and play in my role. I don't care what you want. This is about me coaching you. That was so wrong. Because the kids are like, yeah, okay, well, this guy over here is asking me what I want in my video game. I'm going to go play the video game. And how do I know that they give the kids what they want? What was one of the biggest games before Fortnite just years ago? And it's still kind of big. There's actually a movie coming out about it, I believe. Minecraft. Minecraft. I think there's a Minecraft movie. Who played, who played the early days, I'm dating myself at 98 years old, who played the early days of Pong on the Atari? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and then one day graphics came out, we're like, holy cow, this is almost real to life. These, these graphics are so close to real to life. We were so happy to get rid of the blocky, pixelated, weird-looking things that do not like human, look like human beings, right? And then Minecraft comes on, my, day, my son goes, damn, check it out, coolest game on the planet, you've got to see this. This is the awesomest game. The graphics are awesome. It's so cool. I built a whole world. Take a look. And I go, what did a five-year-old build it? I built this in my computer science class when I was in fifth grade. It's blocky. It's pixelated. What the heck? And he goes, no, it's cool, Dad. That's what the kids wanted. They didn't want the, the graphics. They wanted the other piece of the puzzle. So that's how we know that they gave kids what they wanted. The other reason we know that they gave kids what they wanted was because in Fortnite, my son comes to me a couple of weeks, a couple months ago and says, hey, Dad, can I have 10 bucks? I said, yeah, what are you going to do, buddy? Going to movies? He goes, no, I need to buy V-Bucks. I go, what are V-Bucks? Yeah. He goes, they're in Fortnite. He goes, and if I get enough V-Bucks, I can get a dance. I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the Insta Instagram on, buddy. I'll dance for you for 10 bucks. <laughs> right? A, a fictitious dance in a video game, and he's willing to pay money for it. They're doing something right. So, off topic a little bit, but video games. So, how do we keep our kids in sports? Using these three leadership methods, or three leadership <coughs> secrets of the world's greatest coaches. Before we begin, I want you to ask yourself three quick questions. And then when we end, we'll ask those questions again. Why do I coach? Why do I coach? I gave you my answer just a couple seconds ago, I hope. Why do I coach the way I coach? Remember, it's got to be about them, so why am I coaching the way I'm coaching? And then how does it feel to be coached by me? These come from Tom Bates, the book Future Coach. This is a big one. 
See, we think, a lot of times, we think we're coaching the best way for our kids, but we're coaching the best way for us. We're not coaching the way they learn or the way they engage with us. And so what happens is we never take a step back and say, what would it feel like if I coached myself? I had a coach years ago screaming at his kids, calling them donkeys. They were nine-year-old girls. I pulled him aside. He was a colleague. I wasn't his boss. We were actually both directors of coaching, so he was a colleague, so it was a real touchy conversation. I said, well, this, this, and this, and well, my touchy feeling soft like you, Rita. Okay, fair enough. What if somebody coached your daughter? You have a four-year-old daughter. What if in a couple years somebody coached your daughter that way? Because I'll punch him in the face. I said, how many parents on the other side of us think that right now? Um, right? So sometimes we just don't realize, even if it's not bad, we don't realize what it feels like to be coached by. So think of those three questions while we go through this. All right. Now I gave you those sticky notes. I want you to write on those sticky notes. You can narrow it down to three if you want, but the five qualities of the best coach or teacher you've ever had. Who's done this before? Oh, only a few of you. Great. I was worried that more of you would have done it. We, we do the sticky note exercise all the time. We're not the only ones. A lot of people do it. The five, three to five greatest qualities, okay, of your best teacher or coach. What made them so good to you? Is the mic picking up? Are you good? I got this one. Okay. I'll just yell louder. Okay. And when you're done, just look up so I yell and then we'll move on. You, right? What I really like is that some of you, it's like you go right to them. Other, do you really want to think it through? And it shows your coaching styles. You know, it shows the fact that some of you, man, you you really dialed in on what you want to do, and some of you are like, I'm going to take a second and make sure I'm doing it. Right? And, and both styles are very important because sometimes kids just want somebody that's got a lot of confidence just dive right in. Sometimes they want to coach it. It's a little bit Me, I usually write them right down, and then I put them up there, and then I, and then I reflect and go, oh, wait, can I go back and change that? <laughs> we good? All right. If, look at the five qualities. If the majority of your qualities have to do with things like motivation and um, caring and communication and all of those pieces of the puzzle, if you would, please put your, don't move yet, put your sticky notes over on that side of the camera. If the majority of them have to do with how to tie a knot, how to, um, uh, how to uh, find a mark, how to, anything that has to do with the technical aspects of the sports that you play, whatever sport it was, even if it's sailing, or whether it's sailing or other, put it on that side. So technical over here, all the other stuff over here. All the other stuff here, technical over here. <laughs>
if we connect with our athletes and we let them know that it's about them, and we follow Amanda Missick's research on the 81 different ways to, oh yeah, by the way, when she did her research with the kids, she asked them what is fun. The kids gave 81 different answers that defined fun for them. 81 different answers. And I believe Nadine may have tossed up a slide at one point that showed some of the pieces of the puzzle that, that Amanda Missick talked about. But fun is the number one reason children play, and it's the number one reason they will leave sports. And we have full control over whether they have fun. It's not about sitting in a circle singing kumbaya or total chaos where they're in charge. Fun can be structured in ways that challenge them, make them work hard, teach them new skills, allow them to be with their friends, give them swag. They love swag, right? Uh, all those pieces of the puzzle that have to do with this connection piece. If you rank all the items and then clustered them by 11 different areas, what we discovered was positive coaching. Is that Positive coaching was number three. Look, 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 oops. I knew it was going to do that. Positive coaching, number three. Positive team dynamics, also controlled by the coach, and trying hard, one and two. So if we cluster all the 81 different into 11 categories, the way we coach is the third most powerful thing today. And by the way, the first one has to do with the way we coach, too. We control the culture. If you think you can just ignore culture and it will just create itself, one, culture work is organic. It will always develop and create. Two, we have an opportunity to shape that culture by the way we coach, and that includes engaging the parents in ways that shape the culture. So that shows you, based on the research done by Amanda Bissick, that they want to you connect with them. What about the U.S. Olympic Committee? What, what do they say about what makes a quality coach? Here's the areas for quality coaching, and if we dig into it, look at that. Our national governing bodies are talking to the U.S. Olympic Committee who's saying to them, this is what kids need for a quality coach. And by the way, one of the other things I'm going to teach you is in this slide as well. So kids need connection. So what does that look like for us? Well, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Go ahead and bingo that, right? That's a John Wooden quote. Bingo that. We were talking about that yesterday, kind of John Wooden quote. It, he's been attributed, but other people have too. They don't care how much you know, so they know how much you care. If you really want your kids to learn the most from you, they have to know you actually care about them first, and then they're fully on. It's like turning that channel, that communications channel. So, the easiest way to build a connection with your athletes is to build trust. And if you believe uh, Ken Bryant Blanchard, who works with organizations, he's a, a high power. Uh, Consultant. So now we've talked about Amanda Bissick, who's a researcher. We've talked about the U.S. Olympic Committee, which we know what they do for us, right? They're the driver of the environment for us, and they're on the cutting edge of the research. And now we're going to talk about Ken Blanchard, who works with high-performance organizations. And he says, this is what employees in high-performance organizations need. Trust. Connection. So if we teach our kids about great connection at young ages, we're teaching them to be great employees and bosses someday. So what does trust look like for Ken Blanchard? It's about competence. They want a competent person. Somebody that knows what they're doing. They want integrity. Somebody that says what they're going to do and then does what they're going to do and believes in what they're going to do. They want somebody that cares. Wow. Who would ever thought that employees would want somebody that cares? So how many of you hope that your bosses or your colleagues or the people you work with care about you? Stands the reason that those little ones that are even the 18, 19 ones that we work with, they want us to care about us too. And finally, dependent. So you can see that three different sources tell us that connection is one of the most important things. So now, I'm going to give you a couple takeaways. We now understand how important connection is with our athletes. If they know we care about them, if they know we're invested in them, and it takes just a few seconds, then they're more willing to listen to what we have to say. They're more engaged with us. They're more accountable to us. And more importantly, they feel like they have an ownership piece in the process. When we make it about them, when we show we care about them first and outcomes second, Okay? They're engaged because they feel like they have a locus of control there. It's internal. I am part of this. And now they're playing video games with us, aren't they? My son plays video games because there are no adults. There's nobody telling them it's my way or the highway. And there's, there's nobody there that's doing it how they want to do it and just saying, I don't care if you like it or not, this is what I say. Instead, the video game manufacturer is saying, what do you want to build it that way? And then they get to connect with each other on those games. And they get to get swallowed up in these worlds that that let them feel like they are the most important person in the world. And we can beat the video games when we start making the sporting experience the same way. So here's how you do it. Real easy. 
and this is where I'm talking about five year olds to 25 year olds. First thing, eye contact. It's huge. For me, working with two and three year olds, that means instead of lobbing information down upon them, I had to get down to eye level, maybe change my voice a little bit. Because to a two year old, when I'm talking like this, a two year old's like, whoa! <laughs> but if I get down and I go, like, how are you doing? Are you ready for soccer? Yay! They know I'm excited, but I'm not screaming in their face. But more importantly, the eye contact. I knelt down. I'm sorry, what's your name? Tara. Oh, Tara. I knelt down to give Tara eye contact. She knew it was coming and she still leaned forward. <laughs> it's in human nature. You see, eye contact is straight into the brain. We are speaking right to that, that primal need to connect with others because it's part of us. It's hardwired. Going back all the way to the days, I said this yesterday, when we were cave people and we were just trying to huddle for warmth, fight off the predators and maybe find some food to eat, we used others to help us do that. So when we start making eye contact with people, they're all in, they're drawn in. So what's it look like when we start talking to our athletes that we get to their eye level? If they're our height, perfect. But we've got to get to a place where they can see us. That means no sun behind us. Or my big one, no distractions. I used to coach with fields behind me. And I said, hey, guys, well, nobody's paying attention. And I'm looking at something going on behind me. Oh, here, let's switch sides. Here, you look at blank space. Now, all you have is my eyes. The other thing it means is, unfortunately, I'll get into it, is we might have to take our sunglasses off. But I'll have to once more. The second thing that we can do with our athletes after making eye contact is greet every athlete that shows up in your space. You're inviting them in, and you're telling them they matter. When you don't greet them, they don't feel like they belong there, and they don't feel like they're part of the experience. They're just the vessel into which you're pouring your knowledge. Which, to be honest with us, we did it yesterday, if we're great coaches, if we're quality coaches, we're starting to use a model where we're drawing forth the information from the athletes. We're drawing forth their capabilities. Because the root word for educate, we said this yesterday, is educare. It's Latin for to draw forth. It was never about pouring information into people. Education was always about drawing out of them their own innate knowledge, drawing out of them their ability to synthesize data, drawing out of them their ability to develop capable skill sets. So when we start investing our athletes and greeting them as they come in, what we're telling them is, this is about you. Right? I want you here. Versus I'm just going to dump information on you. I don't care who you are. It's more about, hey, I care that you personally are here. And the final piece of, of, of connecting with our athletes, high fiber fist bump. Craziest thing on the planet, high fiber fist bump. It changes everything, right? It's that human connection. Florida. <laughs> Yesterday, we did a belonging exercise where we had partners, and every time you saw your partner, you had to do a special handshake. And every time I, we do it, every time Charles and I do it, I get so excited to see, like, oh, I can do it. This is really cool. Like, I'm connected to Charles in a way different than other people. So every time we high five an athlete or fist bump an athlete, we're connecting them back to us and back to their own teammates. And I know this, and sorry people from yesterday, I'm gonna tell a quick story. When I was at Soccer Shots, which works with two to nine year olds, okay? It's the largest two to nine, they're actually US Soccer just recently um, partnered with them because they're the largest grassroots or foundation <coughs> development program in the, in the country, and actually in North America. Two or 300,000 kids a year. Two to nine years old. In our particular franchise, we would help 5,000 kids. We decided that it was so important to show these kids we were genuinely happy, which is one of our core values, that we would high-five every kid we saw. And so we did a lot in school. We become the school's gym class. So you're walking through the school lunchroom wearing the orange soccer shots jersey, and every kid plays like, soccer shots gone! Like I said yesterday, we're doing the astronaut walk, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we started high-fiving everybody. Well, we decided that the high five did more than tell those kids we were genuinely happy. The high five was that moment of the day for some of those kids. They weren't even in our classes. But we had no idea what those kids were dealing with in life. And that high five could be the one thing that changed a kid's, changed a kid's life. So we, we came up with the mantra, high fives change lives. Because it reminded every one of us that it took me 30 seconds to give a high five or a fist bump. But whose life could I change in that moment? Who am I connecting to that says that's all I needed? In that moment, that's all I needed. Right? For our athletes, what it tells them is, you are part of this. You and I, we belong in this together. Simple, right? Who has older athletes? Do they still not want to high five and fist bump? Oh yeah, watch, watch the Golden State Warriors, man. They make up entire things, right? They have all the handshakes in there. Yeah, even the, even the elite level athletes, they want that contact. So those are three things you can do to start building connection with your athletes tomorrow. Here's another big one. 
the power of the circle of champions. You all are in an individual sport, but you coach groups, right? Okay. So how do we get individuals to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves, part of a group? And I've had this question asked a lot of times. I'll work with golf coaches. I'll work with uh, running sport coaches. I'll work with ski coaches. And they say, yeah, yeah, but in the end, it's them. Them versus the, the, the time, right? So how do we get them to connect? We discovered that the circle of champions is one of the greatest ways to do it. Beginning of every practice or training session, end of every training session. Everybody circles up shoulder to shoulder. We're making contact, right? We're making contact with our athletes, shoulder to shoulder. Okay, that gives us strength. That gives us safety. We're all making eye contact. Nobody round table was round wide because nobody was more important than anybody else. If I'm in the circle with my athletes, I'm telling them I'm part of this with them. We're all connecting together. We say one thing of affirmation. Today we're going to whatever your one thing of affirmation is. Today I'm going to race the best I've ever raced. Better than I did yesterday. That's all I need, just a little bit better than yesterday. I believe in you all. Go give it your best. Hands in. Oh, and by the way, I learned this from Jerry Lynch. Left hand in, because that's where the heart is. So now we're connected. All right? And whatever, break on three. That circle of chant is what it does at the beginning of every training session or match, and at the end of every training session or regatta, it tells our athletes that they're part of something bigger than themselves. So even that individual athlete knows that they have people there and they're connected. And more importantly, because you stood in the circle with them, I can recall many, many, many a game with my 12 year olds like this, or like this, hands in. I always felt like I was some, part of something bigger than myself, maybe more than those kids. So that's what you can do the power of the circle of chant. Yes. We would do the circle of chancellors at the sailing club. We put all our hands in the middle and we would say all for one. And then when we withdrew them, we'd say and one for all. Because we were trying to emphasize teamwork. Love it. And you know, some kids were really good on teamwork, and some kids were like, no, I'm not going to help that guy be really good. So we just found that was really good to get the teamwork thing going. And what makes a big difference, what you're doing, okay, is I'm that guy that's like, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. I'm, I'm the best sailor in the group. Mm -hmm. But the more I do that, the more I start to feel empathy for the people around me, the more I start to feel connected to them. And even if I still think I'm the best sailor in the group, I start to feel where they are, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're much more connected. And it sinks in, even with your most headstrong athletes, it slowly sinks in with them. Yeah, that's an excellent example. Thank you for sharing that. So the next piece of the puzzle, the world's greatest coaches are extremely effective communicators. You could be the most technical sailor on the planet. Okay, you can sail the lights out anywhere. You could be the former America's Cup captain. Win. But if you can't convey what's in your brain and in your body that you can innately do to somebody else so that they can try to do it, they're not learning. Just because we said it or taught it doesn't mean they learned it. What great coaches have figured out is that the power of communication is how they learn. For me, it's the software. I could have the greatest athlete in the world in front of me, but if I can't get my words right to write the right kind of code in his or her head so that it comes out through the, the hardware of the body, then I failed as a coach. For my weakest athletes, how can I communicate with them in a way so that they find everyday excellence that's just a little bit better than they were yesterday? For my best athletes, how can I push their performance envelope with the way I speak to them? So communication becomes vital. Did you see the word communication anywhere else? <clears throat> it was in the whole thing that's a project play in Amanda Visick on the other slide. Kids themselves said, I want somebody who can communicate, I want somebody who can listen, I want somebody who can care. So the athletes themselves, all the way down to the age of five, six, seven years old, once they can, once they can verbalize it or feel it and think it and say it, all right, they're already saying, I want a great communicator. The power of our words can imprint on the brain. I told the group yesterday, imagine if you always spoke in a way that one not only conveyed the meaning very directly and easily to the kids you spoke to but also built their brains in positive ways because they want positive coaches. It's the third most important area. And you did that for life. What kind of software are you writing for your hands? What athletes have you inherited over the last few years where you realize that somebody maybe a written bad code? How many of you have ever had a computer blow up on you because of malware? <laughs> right? It's the most frustrating thing on the world, especially when your son's the one that downloaded it. I was getting a new video game. Gosh, it's my computer! You put bad software in my computer! So think now, how many times have you coached and thought, well, coach put bad software in this kid's computer, now I gotta, I gotta fix it!
But if we all as coaches started realizing that we write that code, then everybody's writing the right kind of software. Does that make sense, Steve? It's just my simple words. So let's talk a little bit about the communication piece. There it is. What kids want from a coach? Number three and number five, as far as top answers, just come from Project Play. And the Mystics research also proved it. Someone who listens in clear and consistent communication. Listening to the best coaches and best athletes in the world are as good at listening as they are at speaking. Understand that communication is a two-way area. So clear communication and someone who listens. Those are what matters most for our athletes for the top five reasons. Here's how we do it. I already told you one. Get to your athlete's level. If you're on the dock and they're on the boat, find a way to even it out. Right? If uh, they're way out away from you, find a way to get closer. One of the things that we use is in our tool cars that we have now for the, for the foundational level coaches, but it works at the higher levels too, is the 110 one rule. Because I heard guy, I heard you talking about it yesterday with sales. At 100 yards away, you're probably going to have to yell instructions. It's a good chance they're not going to hear you. So hand signals become paramount. 100 yards, everything is hand signals. Predetermined hand signals that they know. For me in soccer, it was this, which is like, you're doing fine, keep going, or great job, and it was this. Stop that. Usually that was when a kid dropped an F-bomb or something at 16 years old, I'm going, <laughs> you and me. <laughs> That's all that needs to be said. Hand signals. And this is the greatest hand signal. I know some cultures, this is not. This is actually like, you know, telling somebody, go jump. But in our culture, this is one of the greatest hand signals you can give a kid. Because they may in their own brain be like, I'm failing, and you go like this, and they're saying, no, coach still believes in me. Or they may have done something right, and all they want is that moment of validation, that encouragement that they're on the right track, and this says you're on the right track. And they may be almost there, almost there, and all they want to do is feel like they're competent. Even though they haven't quite acquired the skill, they're competent, they're close, and keep going. You got it, all right? Ten yards. Now they're close enough, we might be able to have a conversation, but for a fast-moving sport, especially a team sport like basketball, soccer, something like that, I can't carry a meaningful conversation with a kid who's 10 yards away. That means that kid's probably in the game. And they're going, yeah, coach, that's um, Yeah, coach, that's all. Just like, yeah, coach, that's great. Can you just write me an essay and I'll get back to you? Right? You, got, you, got, you probably have colleagues like that. Just put in an email, please. Okay. Right? So it's Twitter speak. It's 140 characters or less, and it's something that the whole group can benefit from. Hands up in the zone! I just told you hands up in the zone, and that benefited everybody else. Because guess what? When I say something to somebody 10 yards away, everybody hears it, just like Twitter. I may think nobody sees it, but trust me. I've tweeted things out before, and I'm like, oh gosh, people saw that. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. Right? Right? We just recently shared a video of Dad pushing a kid in front of the goal to stop a goal. I didn't comment on it. No lie. The dad kids are coming down the field, and that's like, oh, kid, just shut the kid's kid falls. It hits the kid and bounces off of them. So I shared it from changing the game, and all I said was, I, this is not what we meant by parent, positive parent engagement. <laughs> Some guy, how dare you? You're about positivity. Take that down. Wait, wait. I didn't. You liked this. I didn't like it. I reshared it as an example. And I realized people are watching at all times. Same thing when we're speaking around. Please. They're all listening. Right? So 10 yards has got to be for the whole group. And it's got to be easy to do. 140 characters. I cannot give them a dissertation. <laughs> now, at one yard, one foot, they're with me on the dock. They're next to me. They're in the boat with me or whatever it is. Now I can have that meaningful conversation where I can make eye contact and connect with them and have a great conversation about, wait, well, hey, usually it's questioning. What happened out there? What could you do differently? How would that look if you did it differently? Why? Oh my gosh. You're, you're going to do that next time. I believe in you. You're going to do that next time. I drew all the answers out of my athlete. I knew exactly what I wanted the athlete to do. And it's so much easier to say to an athlete, you did this wrong, just do this next time. That's Joyce. So 100 yards, hand signals, 10 yards, Twitter call, one yard, that's that meaningful conversation. So get to their level, no matter where they are. Two, you're in a sport where sunglasses are paramount. And I have a friend who has really, really blue eyes, and she says, they hurts, but every once in a while, if you really want to have a powerful conversation with a kid, even if it hurts, take sunglasses off. You don't have to take them off all the time, but take them off. Here's why. It's in our brains, deep in our amygdala, to not trust things whose eyes we cannot see. And I know this because I had a coach who used to always carry conversations with his parents with sunglasses on. And I got a bunch of phone calls midway through a season from a bunch of parents saying, we don't want to coach that coach anymore. We don't trust him. After multiple conversations, I discovered it's because they all came to the same conclusion. He never takes his sunglasses off when he addresses the parents. They figured he was hiding something behind those glasses. As a kid, they checked out on us. They may not think, oh, this person is devious, they're hiding something. 
but they can't see our eyes, they can't read us, and that's how children do it, they connect through the vision, they'll check out. Even our highest level athletes, they want to see your eyes. I told them yesterday, there's another trick. Back here in the brain is an area called the insula. That's where that self is housed. The self is not locked away in a vault, predetermined at birth and not affected by the world around us. Our self is actually developed by the conversations and interactions we have with the world around us. So when I look somebody in the eyes and carry a meaningful conversation, I'm talking to that person's self. And research shows, brain research shows that the brain is activating while we're having a conversation. Which means that the brain's going, do I believe him? Do I want to believe him? Is he in line with my own beliefs? Can we find common ground? So I'm actually helping communicate with them. And guess what I'm doing? I'm connecting. So eye contact. If I want to convey something to somebody and I really want them to hear it, i got to look that person in the eyes because then they're going, okay, he's talking to me. All right, I'm all okay. Make eye contact with the next one. And then, oops, take now, it says, not anymore. Whatever I'm supposed to say now, I'm not supposed to say now. There we go. <laughs> Ask questions, and I already give you that answer, right? Ask more questions of your athletes. That's great communication. You want to be an amazing communicator? Ask more questions. Believe it or not. I did not ask her to do this, but Nadine put up a slide that said, if you want to really judge a man, judge him by the questions he asks, not by the answers he gives. There you go. So our athletes are actually more in tune with us when we ask questions. I mean, that's the Socratic method. Socrates didn't teach everything. Socrates asked questions to get answers out of people. As coaches, it's as simple as asking questions. I know you have the answer, and you can give them hints and puzzles, but you can't give them all the answers. And we can learn from education on this one. My son's math teacher has never, ever given him the answer key before the test. But he or she will walk around and say, double check your numbers on that. Did you carry the one, right? They're asking questions. Take a look at your thing again. Do you see anything wrong there? And now they're getting to the point where my son will do poorly on a math assignment or math test even, and he gets multiple shots at it. If he can show his work and fix it, he gets multiple shots. That's what we can do with our athletes. Instead of just giving them the answer right away, I say, nope, you get an F, and here's the answer. You should have done it that way. Now we can say, wait, what, what happened? And they get to try again and again and again because we learn through experience. And they learn it and will stay with them longer if they actually felt what it was like to find that answer themselves versus be given that one. And finally, this is John's favorite phrase, talk like a caveman. When working with younger kids, I must talk to them in a way that they understand. For me, for soccer, telling a kid how to do uh, a chip was really hard. I wanted to just scoop your foot under, drive the knee up, and pop it up in the air. And they're like, huh? You like ice cream? Yeah. When you scoop your ice cream, do you stick the spoon straight down? Or do you scoop under and then pop it up? Well, scoop under and pop it up. That ball's ice cream. Your foot's the scooper. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of kids are going, Look, coach, look. But if I'm like, toe up, knee up, connection, pull it like a string, and drive under, and wedge it, you know what a wedge is, you know, and, and angles, and they're like, physics, coach, physics. For the younger players, it may mean also short and sweet, unlike what I'm doing today. <laughs> Less talking and more action. So you get them in. Hey, what about blah, blah, blah? How's that look? Great, off you go. For the older kids, it may not be talking like a caveman, but it may be distilling it into a few words. I heard them for three very important things. We're talking like cavemen now. We're eliminating all the other speak. For instance, when I talk to my athletes, I never bring the science in because they're like, oh gosh, coach is weird. For you, I'll bring the science in so you understand. For the athletes, I'll just give them an explanation with an analogy or a metaphor and we move on. And by the way, analogies, metaphors, those are great. It's like, or similes, it's like this. Do it such as this. Have you ever done this? Same thing, just in sailing. When you start connecting the things they know in their world, like a caveman, they get it. All right. Rule of one, this is your goal, this is your takeaway, other than that last slide, that you can start doing with every one of your athletes. Every one of your athletes is gonna be easier for you. I've worked with rugby coaches and stuff where they're like, I've got 90 athletes. <laughs> one comment, one person, one time, and it can change their day. At every session, can you make one comment to at least one of your athletes? And that one comment could be the thing that echoes for them for life. And I know this because I won't share it now, but I told the group of coaches yesterday, I coach because my coach saved my life. He does not know it. I cannot prove it, but I was in a place. When my soccer career ended, I was in a place. And because of things he said to me over my lifetime of playing for him, at the time it was about five years of a lifetime, that was the one thing I knew that I could do is I could do it for the next generation. One comment, one person changed a life. 
And boy, must he feel good because I'm out there trying my best to get other people to do it too. So it's just echoing again and again through every generation. And one other piece. Do this at the beginning of the season with your athletes. This will really help you with the communication piece. What is one thing I wish my coaches knew about me that would help him or her coach me better? Just ask your athletes that. I'll give you an example. John said he did this with his U12 girls, and he had this girl who was the best player on the team, soccer. So he used her for every demonstration. Susie, come up, show them how to do it. Susie, come up, show them how to do it. He's like, hey, peer assisted learning, visual demonstration of somebody who's close to the same age. So they go, oh, yeah, if she can do it, I can do it. You know, all that, right? She wrote down, I don't like being your demo person. It makes me nervous in front of my friends. It changed his relationship with her, and it changed her relationship with the game once he heard that and altered the way he coached her. That's all it takes. What is it your athletes wish you knew that would help you be a better communicator with them? All right, last piece of the puzzle. And this came up in the USOC, quality coaching, character. What do the New Zealand All Blacks, the Golden State Warriors, the UNC women's soccer team, the US women's World Cup winning teams, and a group of 12-year-old boys from Cincinnati, Ohio have in common? They all put character first. My coach talked me into one year putting character first with a group of 12-year-old boys. They're all now in their teens. And I am constantly getting messages from the parents about what a great young man my kid is because we put character first. New Zealand All Blacks have a rule called the no. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't say it. <laughs> yes, the no, I, that's fine, fine, I love it, but uh, the no jerk head rule. You could be the greatest player in the world, but you don't belong on our team if you're gonna spoil the culture. No culture, no legacy of 114 years of winning based on character is going to be destroyed by one jerk. In fact, the New Zealand All Blacks are so crazy about it that in 2007, they got bounced out of the world in embarrassing fashion, and it was the third time they just lost badly that year. And then that night, guys went out and had a few too many beers, and one of the other teams was pulling them out of the bushes and taking them to their hotel rooms. What an international embarrassment. The coach of the team said, no, this is not who we are. This is not how we will behave. We're losing on the field, and we're losing off the field in life. We will fix this. In fact, he said it on the plane on the way home to New Zealand and told his, uh, his staff, we're going to solve this before the wheels of this plane touch the ground. They retooled in 2007 and went back to character first. That's when they went on a string, 90% winning rate since 2007. 90% winning rate. They don't win because that's their focus. They win because they put character first. Golden State Warriors, character first. I mean, they just, they just went through a rough patch, right? They suspended a player because of lack of character. They put character first. UNC Tar Heels, if you know Anson Dorrance, <laughs> it's character first with those women. And of course, Tony DeChico, the late great Tony DeChico, one of the greatest coaches US soccer ever had, used to always talk about catching his players being good and putting character first. Who they were off the field mattered more than who they were on the field. And let me, let me explain something to you. When you start focusing on the character of your people, what happens is it brings the performance up. Because now that they're focused on what matters most to the team, the core values, they become core behaviors. And when those core values manifest as core behaviors, everybody starts to train at a higher level. And everybody holds each other accountable at a higher level. And that's why I brought up the 12-year-old boys. Because we put character first. And one of our characters' values was ownership. And I didn't put the slide in there, but the boys started asking for more ownership, more influence over the process. Got to the point where I was letting them run their own half times. And there's a picture, and I usually put it in there, of me way off to the side here, and the boys over here huddling at halftime. Parents would take pictures because that was the funny thing. 12 year old boys, they're actually 11, and they're having their own halftime. It was, you got two minutes figure out what you really loved about the first half and what you want to try in the second half, and I'll be back. Not what you did wrong, what you want to try. And in the beginning, I'd come over and I'd go, what do you have? And Because I, I wrote it down on my board. And they'd go, this and this. And I'd go, OK, well, we're going to do this and this. I had veto power. By the middle of the season, it's like, we got this and this. And I'm like, wow, that's really close. Yeah, 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 let's go with that. By the end of the season, it's like, we did this really well, coach, and we want to try this in the second half. And I'm like, yeah, I had that too. <laughs> they were seeing things I wasn't seeing. And I thought I was absolutely nuts. I got, there's got to be something wrong with me. There's a screw loose in me to let these kids run their own halftime. And then Steve Kerr does it. You remember that, right? All the flack he caught for letting his players run their own timeouts. 
And what did he say? It's their experience. They're the ones on the court. Why wouldn't I let them use their experience? My players at 12 years old were seeing things I wasn't, even though I was the expert, because they were the ones experiencing it. It was in their world. I was just helping facilitate it. And the moment I let them have ownership, it was amazing how they blossomed as a team. And here's the final example of that. They had worked for two years, 18 months, as one of their goals. I'm not big on outcome-driven goals, but we had other pieces in play there to get there. They wanted to win a state cup. It was big in our club. It was big in our state. I'm like, all right, but that's not going to be our main goal. But OK, we're in a state championship game. We're playing a team we played four weeks ago that trashed us four to one, like embarrassed us. And we didn't lose that often. We lost maybe like four times in a year and a half. So you can imagine how nervous we are playing this team. We're a couple minutes in, and this team is, again, kind of controlling us. And the kid that's playing in the middle for me, who was like, I never signed captains. Each game, it was a different captain, so they had an opportunity to lead the team themselves. Again, another piece of the ownership. Comes running over, and he says, coach, mid-game, coach, this isn't working. Will, what do you want to do? All right, I think if we run this formation, and I move so-and-so to here, it's going to work. Do it, Will. I'm thinking next time out, we'll adjust it at halftime, whatever. He goes over and goes, Next dead ball, he goes, all right, ball's out of bounds. Mike, over here. Anthony, you're going to play in the center mid. I'm going to drop into a, a supporting role behind that. And Caleb, you're sweeping now, OK? We good? Yep, all right, new formation, guys. Coach from the other team, because he and I are standing there talking, and he's, he's smiling because he thrashed us a, a month ago, goes, are you kidding me? 12 years old, they just created a new formation and ran it. I said, man, I wish I could tell you that was me, but I gave him the keys a while ago. I'm just riding in the passenger seat of the bus with the map. So why do I tell you that story? Because that's what drove that behavior in those kids. Asking for ownership and then creating core behaviors around the ownership allowed them to take full ownership of the experience and build character in them. And that's what Pep Guardiola does. That's what Steve Kerr does. That's what Anson Dorrance does. That's what Tony DeChico does. That's what Steve Hansen at the New Zealand All Blacks does. Steve Hansen says all the time, I'm along for the ride. This is their experience. And by the way, I'm going to put the best human beings I can on the field first and let it all shake out. So if they can do it, we can do it. So you need to be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are while your reputation is merely what others think of you. We know what everybody thinks of the New Zealand All Blacks. But what they care about is who they really are as human beings. And by the way, that's another bingo point, Kevin, because that's another John Wooden quote. So what does that look like with our teams? Well, this is John's Bend, Oregon team. I'm not coaching anymore, so I don't have an example with me anymore. But what he did with his girls is they sat down and did a values worksheet. Once they figured out what values mattered most to their team, everybody signed the worksheet. What they've done is they've just entered into a contract to agree that these are the values we will uphold as a team. I would caution to keep it at five or less. It's a lot easier. All right. But now throughout the season, what happens is John starts, stops holding them accountable, and they start, start holding each other. And I know this because I saw it with my 12-year-olds. And by the way, we started doing this with my 8-year-olds because they had siblings on the 12-year-old team, and even the U8s got it. Is this really what we're about? It is, there's no better feeling than one of your athletes turns to another one, holds that athlete accountable, and that one says, you're right. That's what happens. They start to respect each other through this, and they start to hold each other accountable to the values. You don't have to anymore. You're the guide. But to dig into it, here's how you create that piece of, of paper. You hold a team value session. Do it as short as you want, as long as you want. I've had coaches do it in 15, 20 minutes. If you're limited on time, take a few minutes and do this. But I'm telling you, it is so valuable. You have, them, you have an individual sheet for each player and a large board to write them on, because that's your thing you keep. right? You have the kids list things from last season that they want to keep doing. What did we do really well last season that we want to keep? Then you have them list the things that they want to stop doing. What did we do? Really, what, last season that maybe we should stop doing. And then you want them to do three to five words or phrases that describe a great teammate. This is why we do great teammate. Not, I used to do somebody they admire. right? Great teammate means they're building into each other. You're building unity and connection among them. When you say, when one of them goes, oh, I really like the way Kevin does such and such. And Kevin's like, wow, I'll do that more often. I didn't know you respected me for that. It creates this connection amongst your athletes. And in an individual sport, there's nothing better than seeing that these athletes start to feel a connection even though they're not going to be in the boat together, right? Three to five words to describe a great teammate. Then you go around and you share those, right? And out of those, you're writing them down. And then you say to those athletes, which ones resonate most with all of us together? And that helps you narrow it down to five, right? Three to five of them. Now what you've got is you've got your team values. Write them on the big board. Everybody sign the board. This is our contract. 
This is who we are. This is the way we do things here. This is what defines us as an athlete and as a group and defines me as a coach. And here's the one caveat I did not put on a slide, but please, please, please know because I've made the mistake. Because I was that guy that would say things like, I want you to be creative. I want you to take risks. I want you to go out there and try the things we worked on in practice. Oh, Tommy, what are you doing? Susie, get in for Tommy. He just messed up. Did I live the value of creativity? <laughs> Oh, I subbed him out the first moment he made a mistake. You know what I told him in my actions? Don't ever try new things again because you'll be on my bench. Right? So model, as a coach, this is where we play the biggest role. Model to them those behaviors, and then they start to model them themselves. When they see us continuing to restraint, let's say that one of the behaviors is restraint or respect. If I'm yelling at the referee at every game, what am I modeling to them? But if a referee makes a mistake, and this is my favorite word, and one of my co-coaches co for years used to say, I hate this word, but then finally he saw the value. Big mistake by the referee. Unlucky, Tommy. Unlucky. What it told Tommy was, yeah, I know, that was a really bad call, but just keep going. What it told the referee was, I saw that bad call, so can you make up for it next time, please, versus yelling at the referee. And what it told everybody else on the other sideline was like, shh, because the parents want to jump in, right? Unlucky, unlucky. And my co-coach would go, I'm like, trust me, man, it's working. <laughs> it's better than me screaming and punting balls at the referee, right? <laughs> All right. So how do you do this? Like I said, be intentional. Act out those values. This is a great one. We talked about it yesterday. How many times a session do we encourage? I don't like the re word reward anymore. Do we encourage our athletes for do completing a skill? Probably a lot, right? And those athletes are feeling really rewarded. What about our athletes who aren't quite there yet, haven't gotten to the skill yet? Or what about the athletes who maybe they're not getting the skill, but man, they're explain, displaying our values. What are we doing for them? So this is a really easy thing to add into our training sessions. Alongside us always encouraging skills so it gets better, are we encouraging values? Oh my gosh, Susie, that was great. You showed great honesty on that, and that's one of our core values. Way to go. You're the honest person of the day. Every kid on the team is going, oh, I want to be the honest person next time. And if, that's, if that matters to coach, it matters to me. And suddenly it starts mattering to them without me having to model it. Reward values as, as quickly as you reward skills. Look for those chances, as Tony DiCicco says, to catch them being good. Use teammate shout outs. Beginning, you'll have to run it. But when you do your circle of champions at the end, do a quick shout out. Does anybody have a shout out for another teammate regarding a value? Yeah, um, Johnny was really uh, kind and respectful for, to me today. So I want to say shout out to Johnny. And you're like, great job, Mikey, right? The kids love that voice, by the way. That's another way I connect with them. They're always like, coach, do the voice. What voice? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking normal. And then I'll, you know, when, when they're really goofing off, I'll be like, I'll do the voice when we can get through this, this hard thing that we have to do, but we have to do. OK, OK. And then we do it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we did that great. I guess the voice will come out. Right? So team shout outs. What happens by the end of the season is you'll forget the shout out one time, and a kid will go, coach, uh, value shout out? Oh, yeah, yeah. We've got to have our team loving. Anybody got a value shout out? They start doing it for themselves. And by the way, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the generation where we got plaques for most improved and most this and you know, most valuable. And it was like, oh, yeah, one kid out of 90 got the most valuable. And like, that's the best kid. And the other 89 are like, yep, I quit. I'm moving on. And unfortunately, we're in a trophy generation, and we're all to blame for that. But because of that, this is great. What you can do is you can turn it into something other than trophies. Turn it into something useful. I don't know, umbrellas, a sailor bag, something. But give them, OK, give them, or uh, like the hats this week. That'd be awesome. Like, if that's the values award at the end of the season, give them an award for values. This season, our honesty sailor of the year is Joe. And now what you're doing is you're telling all the kids and the parents, this is what's great, and everybody in your club, values matter first. Character first. Results, they come from the character. Okay. I think I've kept you way too long. So what were the three questions I asked you? Why do I coach? Get really clear on why you coach. Why do I coach the way I coach? You don't have to show, show hands, but did just one thing from either Nadine or I today make you go, hmm, I can make one change and be that much better. See, I get a lot of resistance. You heard it. I've had coaches call me soft, or you're creating the next generation of snowflakes. And I'm like, yeah, watch the New Zealand All Blacks and then tell me that. <laughs> I once had a guy say that in a session. We get to the very end, no lie, football coach. And he goes, um, are we just creating snowflakes when we do that? I said, Great you ask, because the next thing i got to show is a video of the New Zealand All Blacks. And I showed it and I said, would you ever call one of those guys uh, snowflakes? He goes, no way. I said, they do everything we're talking about today. Right? But if there's, I've had those coaches who have said, this isn't me, and I totally get it. I totally get it. But then if there's just one thing that they can take away, I tell them, look, I'm not trying to tell you to coach differently. I'm trying to add one more spice to the recipe so it just, like Emerald used to say, 
pops, right? One more spice to the recipe. So take one thing away that helps you change the way you coach, and it may shape how you would feel to be coached by you. Connect with them. Communicate as effectively as you can with them because you can say a whole lot more with a lot less words, especially a lot less than I did today, and put character first. And here's the beauty. You will discover that you will create phenomenal sailors out of those three pieces of the puzzle. But more importantly, you will discover that you will create phenomenal human beings who succeed in life. And there is no greater feeling in the world than having a, an athlete call you up on your wife's birthday and say, Coach, I'm in Stanford, California, dropping my sister off at school. And I haven't seen you in quite a few years. Can I come see you? Me turning to my wife, because I'm on speakerphone in the car and, going, and her going, yes. Like, really, on your birthday? Yes. And walking the beach with him for an hour, finding out that he's in coaching now, that he hopes that he can coach his kids the way that I was coached and coached him, that his life is different, and that you just realized he drove eight hours from Stanford just to see you before he go drives back to fly out the next day. That beats any trophy that I ever won. So I hope that something here today helps you create that same feeling I got. Here's some books I recommend to help you along the way with those. And today, we came out with our books of 2018. There's some phenomenal ones in there, including Amy Saltzman's Mindfulness book. I really love it because it's a whole total departure from typical coaching, like me. And uh, I recommend any one of these books and the ones on our list. And I'm happy to take any questions. And I think I got you out there. Oh, look at that. Right on time. <laughs>